on this edition of Independent Sources. Is there still hope for comprehensive immigration reform? I think that what we have seen is that the comprehensive approach um, really didn't work. Um, and I think that that's because there are too many people, uh, too many stakeholders, actually, for comprehensive immigration reform. And I think the approach needs to be reevaluated. And a new wave of immigrants brings some aloha spirit to the U.S. mainland. A lot of it has to do with uh, people who, in Hawaii, who graduate from high school and then come to colleges on the East Coast and then find opportunities to work here. And so the, that community grows and grows. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Sarah Pizon. The drive towards comprehensive immigration reform virtually came to a screeching halt at the end of 2013. In fighting in the Congress and concerns over the implementation of the Affordable Care Act took over the headlines. Now support from labor groups and prominent business associations may be energizing immigration advocates to push the issue back to the front pages. Even with that renewed vigor, there are those who believe that the plan for reform may have to be revamped. Zyphus Lebrun spoke with immigration advocate Abraham Paulos about whether comprehensive reform can really happen. Abraham, thank you very much for being with us in studio today. Thank you. All right. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, comprehensive immigration reform, the third real topic, if you will. Um, I know your organization, um, Families for Freedom, has a bit of a different take as regards to what you guys see as what you want coming out of reform. So let's start with that. What, what were your, some of your issues with this plan that was coming out for comprehensive immigration reform? Great. Well, I mean, we are a human rights organization by families that are fighting and facing detention and deportation. So at the root of our organization is the detention and deportation of our communities and our family members. So we tend to have that perspective on sort of things. We also work with a population that is um, African, Asian, and heavily Latino, and also Caribbean. Um, in New York City, which provides a different perspective by meaning that um, a lot of our people do uh, have issues with poverty, right? Um, also the over-policing of our communities. So we come from that perspective. And so what comprehensive immigration reform means to our population and means to our organization is seeing the mitigation of the detention system and the mitigation of the deportation system. So anything that is not um, addressing those issues for our communities, which is the biggest reason why we're even really talking about comprehensive immigration reform, is that there is record-breaking deportations, um, many non-citizens that are getting locked up for a long period of time, and we felt that comprehensive immigration reform, as it stood when it passed through the Senate, was not really addressing those issues and also the root issues that our communities do face. Do you think that this is now a time to maybe reconsider some of these you know, changes that could be made to make, you know, reform, if you will, more suited to those co those communities. Those yeah, um, I think that an approach needs to be revisited and reevaluated. Um, I think that the reform itself, on one hand, we can have a conversation sort of about the content, and I think that what we saw this year, um, well, actually in 2013, was an approach. Is the comprehensive approach the best way to get what we need or are there different approaches? Are there alternatives? And I think that what we have seen is that the comprehensive approach um, really didn't work. Um, and I think that that's because there are too many people, uh, too many stakeholders actually for comprehensive immigration reform. And I think the approach needs to be reevaluated, not necessarily uh, the content because I think the content got to such a place where it's an 800-page bill. Who wants to sort of go through that? So many different components in it. Um, and I think that if we really look at the approach that we actually might be uh, moving forward and getting some progress on it. So what you're saying is that do you think that more of a piecemeal approach would be better taking it in blocks? For instance, if you will, with, with the Dreamers, they got deferred action. Do you think that that sort of approach where perhaps clusters of, of immigrants or immigrant groups or immigrant advocates will get specific issues addressed? Do you think that that is, a, do you think that? I, I, think, I think we need an alternative, mm -hmm. right? And a piecemeal approach is an alternative to the comprehensive approach. Is it the best approach? Is it a solution to it? It's really hard to say. Um, I think that there is also, you know, other things that we can consider. 
I think that looking to the federal government, looking to Congress to push something uh, might be ambitious. I think that what we're also seeing is sort of local efforts trying to change things in our local communities um, that might be also added into sort of uh, the way that we move forward. The Dreamers are a great example of them taking their fight to a, to a state level by trying to get in-state tuition, such as what's happened in New Jersey. Um, I think that that approach seems to be a bit more promising. It's still a little early to say, but I do think that if we try to contextualize that approach and make it more of a local um, kind of thing, I think we might be you know, moving forward. New York City is a, you know, another great example where you really look at what our communities are facing, which is detention and deportation, and the systematic bind between the criminal legal system. So when you look at what New York City and you reflect that reality is going to be different than what folks in California and folks in Arizona. It might have been, um, we might have been shooting for the stars, as someone would say, when we're trying to look at something comprehensive on a federal level. Maybe the state might work. Maybe piecemeal might work. So an alternative is definitely needed. What that looks like is really too hard to say. Mm -hmm. Now, you know what? There's been a lot of support from, you know, big lab from big labor. And, and I'll just read this quote quickly. We're determined to make 2014 the year that immigration reform is finally enacted. The chamber will pull out all the stops through grassroots lobbying, communications, politics, and partnerships with unions, faith organizations, law enforcement, and others to get it done. And I mean, that's from the, the, the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Now, when you hear statements like that about pushing for immigration reform, can that impetus really kind of trickle down? You know, like he mentions grassroots organizations like yours and so forth. Do you feel like, you know, with this sort of airs to the ground, people are kind of listening now? Do you think that this is now really now the time to do it within, you know, six to seven months? Um, I think that um, the, that's a bold statement. Uh, that he makes. I mean, I think that, you know, it needs to be applauded that they're actually looking at it. I think immigration issues in this country have been highlighted to make it on main stage. Um, how we get there, again, is, is really, really different. Um, on a personal level, as far as what our communities um, are sort of saying about comprehensive immigration reform, I think that we are disillusioned. Um, and I think our disillusion is really rooted in the disconnect between the perception of our issues as non-citizens and the reality of what we go through as non-citizens. Now he brings up many different agencies, talking about the law enforcement agency, talking about Department of Labor. We're also looking at the military that's all involved. And I just think that in any sort of sense of the word, you can't really bring all of these people together and say we're going to come up with one package that fits for all. I think what I would like to see is an alternative approach where we look at the law enforcement agencies, have a seat with them and saying these are our issues reflecting law enforcement and the community policing that we go through. Uh, when you look at the Department of Labor and Employment, these are the issues uh, such as wage theft that is going on, such as insecurity when it comes to employment, and looking at that issue and saying, let's separate all of the other noise um, and focus on these specific issues as to get something that in the end will be comprehensive. Um, but right now, I just think that it's really political that people want to sort of um, grandstand and say all of these things. But again, our communities are just looking up there and saying, look, you know, Congress is made up of mostly millionaires. How are these people sort of going to really reflect and try to solve the issues that we have in which we know um, are personal because of our families, that uh, we know that are local because of our communities? Mm -hmm. I want to kind of go back to the place that we started with this before we even end. When we started, we talked about the fact that your organization had certain issues with comprehensive immigration reform. Very much so. Right? In the end, if this passes, if it passes in the form that the Senate had, had agreed to a few months ago, will there still be issues in your mind with what, what we get at the end? I think that, there, yeah. There, even for our population, there might even be an exacerbation of issues. Um, in particular, we can look at the, the, the pathway to citizenship. Now, in general, because we have a human rights framework, we don't think that, that you need to be a citizen to have the right to a lawyer in court. We don't think that you need to be a citizen to be employed and not unemployed for 60 days. So on a very fundamental level, what we're looking for are rights that are based in dignity and not rights that are based in a legal status. 
the pathway to, to citizenship was a very, very thorny road uh, with lots of twists and turns. And I think one of those, again, because it's not reflective of our community, is the issue around employment and poverty. Um, what, as it stands, what passed in the Senate, it says that you cannot be unemployed for 60 days or more. Now, we are living in a society that doesn't even ask that from its own citizens. Um, and how is it that they're going to ask that from even a more marginalized population, a vulnerable population? There's also issues with getting um, income that's a certain percentage over the federal poverty line which means that you can get kicked off the path to citizenship if you don't make enough money. Now, again, is this really reflective of our communities? The other major um, issue that our population had found, and especially with the Central American community, is the, border, um, the militarization of the border. When you look at the, the, the building of the troops and you look at the, the more billions and billions of dollars that's only focused sort of on the so southern border, um, I think we need to rethink um, what that means and what heavy enforcement looks like. So with the way that comprehensive immigration reform is now, if it was to pass, I actually do think that in certain respects we might find some relief uh, or a certain minority of a population, right? They say that there are 11 million undocumented. Um, we're looking at about roughly around 13 million legal permanent residents, right? So we're looking at a, at a population of over 20 million people that are not citizens that are dealing with everyday realities. So if CIR was to pass this year, um, I do think that our hands would be full um, with, you know, community organizations that are working around um, detention, deportation, and the undocumented population. I think that uh, I know my job would be a lot harder. All right. Well, Abraham, on that note, we have to end it here. But thank, thank you, you so, so much. very much for being with us today. No it's problem. good seeing you. Yeah, good seeing you. Thank you. All right. Still to come on the show, helping Muslim elderly in Brooklyn. Before that, Abby Ashola has some other news. Thanks, Sarah. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. From Voices of New York, a growing number of Asians are moving into Diker Heights, Brooklyn, seeking good schools and better living conditions. The neighborhood has seen a 100% increase in its Chinese population from 2000 to 2010. Today, there are over 12,000 Chinese residents in the area. Bensonhurst and Sunset Park, which border Diker Heights, are also seeing an increase in Chinese residents. The city's planning department says there are now more Chinese-born residents living in these areas than in Manhattan's Chinatown. A recent incident involving six senior citizens who were thrown out of a McDonald's in Flushing, Queens, is highlighting the growing number of Korean seniors with no place to go. Police were called into a McDonald's by the store's workers to remove Korean seniors who had allegedly occupied several seats for almost 10 hours. The Korea Times reports that of the over 10,000 Korean seniors living in New York City, many prefer to congregate at neutral places such as restaurants and casinos. They complain that senior centers are too isolated and make them feel old. Guanxiu Kim, president of the Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York, says he plans to open a cafe like McDonald's for Korean elders at his headquarters to address the issue. New bus routes in the outer boroughs may equal more job creation and economic activity. The Brooklyn Bureau reports that Mayor de Blasio's plan to implement eight more bus rapid transit, or BRT, routes could make jobs more accessible by linking areas like the Sunset Park Industrial Waterfront to areas in East Brooklyn. Those living in transit-deficient neighborhoods now have the opportunity to find work in areas that were once hard to reach. The Pratt Center for Community Development, along with the Rockefeller Foundation, nominated the eight potential routes based on such benefits like connecting job centers, healthcare, and educational hubs with areas where people live more than half a mile from a subway station. City Limits profiled a former foster care caseworker about his program that supports overworked social workers. In 2011, Barry Chafkin joined forces with Vivian DeMille, an administrator of New York City's Children's Services. The two formed a program called Children's Corps as a way to support caseworkers and help reduce the high annual turnover rate of 40 percent. Chafkin told City Limits that starting salaries range from the low 30,000s to the low 40,000s. He says most caseworkers are overworked with long hours, endless paperwork, and limited resources. 
Children's Corps has given four-week training sessions to groups of new hires to give them support and tips on how to remain dedicated to the job. Thereafter, they meet weekly to reinforce the training and discuss issues they're facing. And finally, a new study finds that Latino children use electronic gadgets more frequently than non-Latinos. According to the data gathered by the Center on Media and Human Development at Northwestern University, the majority of Latino parents feel smartphones, tablets, and computers have a positive impact on their children's academic development. Yet one in three Latino homes can afford such gadgets, compared to almost half of non-Latino families that have at least one. That from El Diario La Prensa. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Independent Sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. One community group in a predominantly Muslim neighborhood in Brooklyn is providing some much needed recreation and support for a few of the area's elderly residents. The Council of People's Organization, or COPO, started the group in Midwood after they found that many elderly in the community had no access to food or support systems. I sat down with COPO's founder, Mohamed Ravzi, to talk about the center and how they're helping this population. So the creation of your senior, senior center came out a bit as a surprise. Tell us about how it all came together. Well, um, unfortunately, there was actually a, a flood that happened in 2012 in Pakistan. And we were working with our city officials and others putting things together to you know, transport them because uh, we're a center, a community center where everyone comes to. Um, as we were doing that, there's a mosque next to me, and the seniors, after prayers, they seen all these foods displayed, which was meant to, you know, be transported overseas. They came and they asked me, can I have some of this food? And we were like, oh my God, we didn't know that there was a big issue with the seniors such as that, especially with the Muslims. So what we did was, we immediately had a conversation with our board, and they transformed our community center into a major first halal senior center. That, has, that does not exist in New York, It right. does not exist. I mean, I actually searched online trying to find a center where I could actually refer them to because, uh, I'm like, there's got to be a Muslim senior center, not one in the five boroughs. So my board decided, and they have expanded it, and it's been continuous. Um, tell us uh, about the stories of some of the people that originally came to, uh, to the senior center. Well, one of, for example, let me explain you about this. You know, this uh, husband and wife, they came... They had nothing too much to eat at home, so when they started with us, actually our nurses who go to visit their home, they're telling us the food that we're giving them, that's the food in their fridges, which showed it was such a need, and we continuously worked with them. And then after Hurricane Sandy, this particular senior was, you know, out of a home even, and he was actually the key individual who actually, the reason why we started the Hurricane Sandy Relief. He came to our office, and now... You know, lo and behold, one of the success stories is that he has a, an apartment in downtown Manhattan, which is affordable to him. He has food stamps, and he's able to really, you know, have a living where he can, you know, sustain a living for himself and his wife. That's fantastic. Um, tell us about the different uh, types of services that you provide in your center. So in our center, the most important thing that we provide is transportation and food. So we pick up the community members from their homes. There's a bus and a driver and an aide. They pick them up, bring them to our center. They get breakfast. They get lunch. They get activities to do, um, exercise. I have a registered nurse. I have a doctor there. Mm -hmm. So they check their vitals. You know, and t a couple of times, uh, one of the seniors who came in, she wasn't taking her meds, and we asked her. And the, the nurse actually took her blood pressure. And then they made a decision. They wanted to make sure that the family is understanding that they have to make sure that they take their meds. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the services. Making doctor's appointments. So many of the seniors are not even able to do that. So we do that. And so I, I understand that you cater to a large South Asian Muslim community, right? You have Bangladeshis, Pakistanis. Yes. How do you, um, how do you make sure to s that the center addresses the cultural ah. needs of all of those Well, the most people. important thing is it's not just the Bangladesh and uh, the Pakistanis. We also have Arabs. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a Bangladeshi person who speaks Bangladesh, She's from, and she helps the seniors. I have an Urdu-speaking person who's from Pakistan. I have a Arabic speaker who's from Morocco. So I have individuals hired to cater toward their needs from people from their community, from their center, from their um, countries. And so what are some of these 
needs or maybe rituals or cultural? Well, one of the most important thing is uh, for these seniors, for 60, 70 years, what they've been doing, they've been, whenever they go to any events, the women sit on one side, the men sit on the other side. This is one of the things what we have. We have two floors, one floor is for women, one floor is for men. Second thing that they have is they're able to study their Arabic, mm -hmm. their Quran. So we have a section where they actually sit and they read. Other things are the games, the cultural games. I mean, it was so fascinating seeing them, you know, the Arabic community and the Muslim, uh, Pakistani community playing different types of games. I said, yeah, this is the game that we play in our country, in Pakistan. Meanwhile, the Arabic community, they're playing a different game. Uh, so it's wonderful to see that interaction with them. That's great. Um, do the people that are in your senior center, do they uh, participate with COPO's original mission? What yes. is that original mission? Well, the original mission is to actually help their family members to understand the intricacies of uh, becoming an American in the society. You know, what are their rights? What are, you know, the education? Many people come to us, they just want help with their immigration issues, mm -hmm. or they want to learn English, or they want to become citizens. So we provide all those services, and their family members also take participate in those services. That's awesome. Um, I know that you've celebrated birthdays and even organized yes. a field trip to the Statue of Liberty. Yes. So my question is, why, why the Statue of Liberty, and what were the reactions? Well, the most important thing is they've always heard about the Statue of Liberty. They've always seen it from far away, but when we took them on the trip, and they said, we said, this is where it is, and they were just you know, taken back because they never got a chance to do that. All these seniors, just like other seniors, what they think is, five years, I'm going to go to America, make some money, I'm going to go back. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't happen. They end up bringing their families, and 20 years, 30 years, 40 years pass by, and then they're like, you know what, this is the place I have to be. But they never got a chance to visit. And now at this age, either their children are too busy, mm -hmm. or their family members are too busy, and they're just sitting at home. We brought them to uh, Madame Tussauds we brought them to the Intrepid Museum. I mean, never in their life they would ever imagine they would see the space shuttle, right, so close. It was just, they were just like, I want to take a picture, I want to take a picture. I have so many, you know, so many of them just <laughs> jumping for joy. That's great, so how many people now participating? So now we have about 40 individuals participating. Um, we've ran out of space, like I was mentioning, and uh, we're looking to expand it for the center, for the community members. That's great, and so what do you hope people will kind of learn from, from this first Halal Senior Center? Well, the most important thing is the community members, first of all, they should know that there is services available. Um, I mean, we actually had a conversation at the mayor, mayor's office, the new mayor, and we explained to them, you know, it is such a need for all ethnicities. It's not just the, uh, you know, the Muslim Halal Senior Center, it's also the Chinese uh, community. There are these ethnicity community members which are growing where their seniors have no place to go. And we need to fill in that gap before they become, you know, God forbid that, you know, they become, uh, you know, uh, homeless or something that happens. And that's the other thing that we're looking at. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. When we come back, why more Hawaiians are bringing their aloha spirit to the mainland. from us. Hawaiians may be few in numbers, but their community here in New York is growing at a fast pace. In just the last three years, the population of Native Hawaiians migrating to New York has doubled. Young entrepreneurs like Crystal and Costa, who opened a Hawaiian-themed restaurant in Brooklyn, are making their way to the mainland. I'm here in Williamsburg at Onomai Restaurant. It means the best place, and it serves some of the best local dishes from Hawaii. Span musubi, loco moco, you name it. This place is here to satisfy a small but growing community. The goal is really just like mom and pop shop, home cooking. Like for the locals, it's definitely the vibe. Like they come in, they hear the music that they hear back home that they haven't heard in months or weeks or years. Crystalline Costan was just 24 years old when she opened up Onomea in Williamsburg in September of 2013. 
The idea began brewing while pursuing her bachelor's degree at Kingsborough Community College. She often craved her family's recipes, but when she couldn't find her fix in New York, she realized the city's international cuisine still missed some Hawaiian flavor, and she saw an opportunity. It's just the fact that there's no Hawaiian food when you can get, uh, I don't know, every other type of food in the world in New York City, but they're very underrepresented. Her recipes are all her grandmother's. She taught her how to cook. I got a taste of a few of the dishes. This looks amazing. It smells delicious. Tell us what, what, what all of this is. And this is Kahlua pig. It's just a pulled pork, a mm. smoked um, pulled pork with cabbage. This is poke. poke. It's a cubed ahi tuna with a little bit of seasoning. This is a loco moco. It's a hamburger beef patty, sunny side up egg, a mound of rice, and brown gravy all around it. Mmm. Wow. The gravy is so good. Kimo Gerald has been living in New York for more than 30 years. He's on the board of directors of Halavai, a nonprofit organization that helps promote Hawaiian culture on the East Coast. He says the Hawaiian community is likely to keep on growing. A lot of it has to do with uh, people who, who in Hawaii who graduate from high school and then come to colleges on the East Coast and then find opportunities to work here. And so the, that community grows and grows. And of course, um, to find work in the New York area is, is very remunerative. <laughs> and so. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, about 4,000 people migrated to New York from Hawaii from 2006 to 2009. That number doubled in the last three years. Costa was among the many young professionals who moved to the mainland four years ago, and she's encouraged her friends to come to New York. Back home, you don't really, like, you kind of, you know what you want to do, but when you're open to like so many more opportunities, maybe your ideas change or you develop new ones that you're like, I didn't ever think that I was interested in something like that. But it wasn't like at your fingertips. Starting her own business so far from home wasn't easy. Costa had to take out a loan and do a complete renovation. It was her Aloha spirit that kept her going. Aloha spirit. <laughs> um, it's, it's so hard to describe really, it's just, it's just a way of life. It's being friendly and kind and everyone's family and no one's different. Today, Onomea welcomes both Hawaiians and local Brooklynites. With positive feedback from her customers, Costa hopes to expand Hawaiian food in the Tri-State area. For Independent Sources, I'm Sarah Pizon. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.